Hello, one person. <laughs> oh, no, and I have no audio. Are you kidding me? This was all set up last time. <laughs> Why? This shouldn't be difficult. This shouldn't be difficult. Okay. Hello? Can you guys hear me? You can hear me. Yes, give me someone else. Tell me if you can hear me because I am actually seeing that I have no audio connection. Weird. Oh, my God. Okay, Sorry, guys. I tried. So <laughs> after last week, I tried this. Uh, you can like apparently you can schedule events. I'm going to try to keep an eye on this. I also hate this mic. I have a new mic coming next week. I hate using this for video. It's like way too in your face. Um, I tried to do this whole thing where like you can set up the video ahead of time and then let people come in for like a waiting room kind of thing so that you get people there. This also breaks all of the links that I tweeted out on social media. So that's great. Um, um, I'm so annoyed. I'm so annoyed. But this is why I have a meeting with YouTube in an hour and a half. So unfortunately, guys, um, yeah, give me half a second. I am going to put this across my social channels yet again. Because uh, I didn't already do this three times today. <laughs> um, this is so this is so frustrating. I was really, really uh, fixing to just like go live and just jump right into it because everyone would be here. I had like 60 people waiting. Oh, stupid thing. And um, yep. Nope. Apparently not because that link failed. Fun times. Good times. Um, I'm also going to give it a second for some people to get here. I don't know how many people were in uh, the last one that failed, but we're just going to give you guys a minute. I'm just going to update my Twitter status so that those people know what's going on. Uh... And we're tweeting, and we're tweeting. Okay. I think that's good. I think that's everything. All right. So... Welcome to this awkward delayed start that I was really hoping to avoid um, for a uh, for another installment of the virtual book tour. Oh, you know what the problem is? I don't have a copy of my book next to me. Er, hang on one second. We're just gonna we're gonna lunge. We're gonna lunge. We're lunging. All right. This is this is my galley copy because I I don't actually have a hardcover near me. Um, so if you are new here, which I feel like is probably not the case, but in the odd in the off chance that you are new here, uh, I'm Amy. Uh, I wrote this book, Fighting for Space. It, uh, it comes in a much nicer hardcover than this. Uh, like I said, this is the galley. Um, my book came out in February, which means there is no book tour because the world is kind of shut down and public events are not happening right now. Um, so instead, I'm doing this virtual book tour. Every week, we are discussing another facet of the book, either something that I think is really interesting and I want to draw attention to, or something that didn't fully get explored in the book because you can only do so much before it's like, honestly, guys, it's a pet peeve of mine when a, when a writer is like, and I found this detail and this detail and this detail. It's like, we get it. You researched. Don't just tell me how great your research is. Make me care about the story. So there were definitely things that did not get in the book because it was just going to be like, okay, great. Congratulations to me. Like I didn't need that. So that's what we're doing in the virtual book tour. And today um, we are discussing a facet of this woman on the cover right here, Jackie Cochran, uh, who in addition to being one of, if not the most outstanding pilot of the 20th century, also ran a luxury cosmetics line, which is super fun. Um, and I, I love it. And we're going to dive in a little bit more. Uh, Trying to think if there's any other housekeeping I need to do to get started here. Um, I think we're probably good to go. Um, I hear that my, my, sorry, I'm, Trump, Pete's been biting my feet this morning, so I'm trying to, like, sit cross-legged so that he cannot nip at my feet. I'm going to adjust my lighting ever so slightly because I got a note from my lovely behind-the-scenes helper that I'm a little bit washed out today. Um, 
let's let's try that and see. I don't know. I just get washed out by the monitor, guys. I'm I saw a couple of people earlier saying that I uh, I look sick. I'm not sick. I am just really pale. <laughs> I am just deathly pale all the time. Um, all right. So I think we've got 115 people. I think that is uh, going to to be like I guess we'll call that quorum and we'll get started. Um, okay, so I I'm a little bit on my own today in terms of answering questions. So I'm going to try my darndest to uh, keep the discussion portion of this uh, this book tour stop virtual stop uh, short, so that I have a lot of stuff I want to show you guys, and then I can actually look at the questions a little bit easier because um, I don't have as much help on the back end right now. Um, I just saw a question if I'm going to be able to have a physical book tour in 2021. Who knows? Uh, we'll find out. You know. <laughs> don't uh, don't have an answer to that one. Um, and I, I did see a question earlier in the previous stream. Uh, someone was asking, um, or I guess you guys were more discussing whether you could uh, wait for the movie on this, like we're working on it, but <laughs> we'll have updates on like the, the who knows. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's up in the air with this, you know, all these things. Trust me, people ask about it all the time. And like, it's something that's definitely like hopeful. Um, so yeah, uh, those are the first few questions I found. Um, someone said Irish jeans get the panelists. Actually fun story, not really funny and not much of a story, but I was in Ireland once and this guy, this like lovely old man stopped him and was like, it's such, it's so nice to see a nice Irish lass. And I was like, I am very Canadian. He's like, Oh, well, it's about the same. It's like, thanks dude. Um, okay. So, so it's kicking off. I do want to, I just want to draw attention to this because this is the first time I've actually taken it out of the box. Um, and I recognize if we're, you know, my audience, I know you guys skew very male. So <laughs> thanks for sticking around to learn about the intersection between aviation and cosmetics. Uh, so this is actually, here's the box it came in, trying to get it without reflection. Uh, Les Foulards by Nina Ricci in Paris. This is actually uh, Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics owned Nina Ricci for a time. And this did come with, I love this. This is why I haven't actually taken it out of the box yet, but I thought this was a good time to debut it. Um, it does come with a holiday card oh my gosh from presumably two managers at Jacqueline Cochran Incorporated so I love that this came with this scarf so this is why I am wearing I don't normally do jaunty neck accessories um, but today seemed like the day to do it so let me run you guys through a little bit of the history of the Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics Company and kind of where all of this came from so for those of you who don't know, which I feel like is probably pretty rare, Jackie Cochran was the most decorated, award-winning, record-holding pilot of the 20th century when she died in 1980. Uh, she has a really fascinating life story. Unfortunately, because the stream broke, I wasn't able to retain all of the links for you guys in the description, so I'm going to have to add those in later. Um, if you go to the Vintage Space on Medium, you can find uh, last week's article, which is about how Bessie Pittman, which is Jackie's birthday name, how she became Jackie Cochran. And it really kind of shed some light on the woman that she kind of invented herself to be and how she kind of had the, the moxie to go forward into life as a pilot and just take everything on full steam. So in short, Jackie Cochran is a really fascinating woman. I absolutely loved digging into her story. Um, she learned to fly in 1932 when she was 26 years old. And by the she got her license, I should say, in 17 days, which is unheard of in any day and age. And um, within within years, by the end of the decade, she had won the major aviation trophies, the Harmon Trophy and the Collier Trophy. She was the first woman to win the Bendix Transcontinental Air Race alone. Um, she had become friends with President Roosevelt and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she made friends with... Uh, Randy Lovelace and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, in the war, she led the Women's Air Force Service pilots. Uh, after the war, she became the first woman to break the sound barrier. Actually, Chuck Yeager taught her how to fly a jet and flew through the sound barrier with uh, him on her wing. They were on each other's wings. <laughs> and um, she had an unsuccessful bid for Congress in 1956. Um, that's the highlights, really, of Jackie. She also saved LBJ's life one day in 1948, like you do. Um, and, you know, this is that's the the vanishingly quick look at kind of the, the career highlights. Um, it's also worth noting that she was married to Floyd Bostwick Odlum, who is not a very familiar name, but he is one of the 
the robber barons who really built America. He was one of the 10 richest men in the country when he and Jackie met in 1932. And um, was right up there with the Vanderbilts, the Schwabs, all of all of those families that you hear about that just had all of the money that actually, you know, had money and made more money out of the Depression. Floyd was right in there. Um, but because they had no children and no estate, uh, his name has kind of disappeared. They also lost a lot of money, uh, still figuring out how exactly that happened. But so that's that's the the brief intro to Jackie. So the interesting thing about Jackie is like I kind of hinted at, uh, she was born Bessie Pittman and she wasn't born into any kind of aviation family. She was born in 1906, which means she was actually born, uh, not long after aviation. Um, of course the first flight in, you know, the, the Wright brothers were just getting off the ground, uh, when she was yay big. Well, not actually like yay big. Um, so it's not like she grew up with the influence of aviation. It was actually not something she had much familiarity with. She bounced around. Uh, she was born in, and grew up a lot in Defuniac Springs, Florida. Her family bounced around a lot. But she also lived in Alabama and Georgia for a time. Um, and her industry was beauty. So her, her dad worked in a mill. Uh, she was forced to work in a cotton mill when she was 11. And she left the mill at 11 and ended up working as kind of a general errand girl in a salon. And the woman who took her in named Mrs. Rickley taught her how to do hair, how to mix dyes and how to do all kinds of different beauty treatments. And Jackie, then Bessie, realized that she could make money doing cosmetics treatments and money meant she could get out of a poor mill town. So she stuck with beauty and her really, her only kind of crossover with aviation in her early life was she ended up working in Pensacola, Florida, which did have an, the Naval School of Aviation. I don't know offhand what year it was established, but it was there in the kind of First World War era, um, post-war era. And she met young, young pilots training at the time. And that was kind of the only intersection she had with aviation. She was fully into the beauty industry. She did really well. She was so she was so good and she had such a, a loyal roster of clients. I mean, this is how the the business works. You have clients, they follow you where you go and you can make demands based on that. So when she was a teenager, she was able to actually say, you know, I don't want a base fee. I will get 50% of all my appointments in, in lieu of, of that base fee. Um, she, she was able to, to gain a higher, a higher society roster of clients too, that were able to pay more for their transformations, for their dyes, for their cuts, for their styles and everything. So this was really her way out. And she, she maintained that she actually owned a salon in Pensacola, co-owned a salon in Pensacola for a time, but realized she didn't like being in business with someone who she felt was a disorganized mess of a business partner. Um, left that she tried to go to beauty school in Philadelphia, but felt that her teachers were not able to teach her anything she didn't know. So she left that as well. By the time she was in her early 20s, she felt like she was at the top of her profession. There was nothing more for her to do in Florida, Alabama, Georgia. All of the connections she had were at kind of mid-range salons. And she really wanted to push herself to the next level. And she knew that, you know, if you're going to further your career as a beautician, the place to go is the heart of the beauty world, which at the time, especially on the East Coast, was New York. So she arrived in New York in 1929 as a 20, oh math, as a 23-year-old beautician and walked into the, uh, walked into one of the top salons in the city and demanded a job. Uh, she was denied and uh, went into the other top salon that was in direct competition with the first salon and got a job. So almost immediately, she ends up working in one of the top salons in New York City where all of her clients are these rich and wealthy women who not only love that she's so talented with what she does, love that she's great company. And she starts kind of being able to circulate on the side of the upper echelons of New York society because she does the hair of the rich women whose husbands are in that upper echelon of high society. So in the early 1930s, she starts uh, splitting her time between New York and Miami. She's working at a salon in New York called Antoine's, and Antoine's has a sister salon in Miami that all of the wealthy, wealthy New Yorkites fly south effectively for the winter and winter in Miami. And one of her clients convinced her to actually travel south for the winter with her so that 
She could take her to good parties and introduce her to eligible men slash always have her hair looking great. Um, so Jackie ended up doing this kind of not bi-coastal, but the bi-city life where she was living in New York, um, except for a few months in the winter when she'd go down to Miami. And in both cities, she had this this ability to to circulate in this high society, something she would never have experienced as a child. So all that's happening in the background, we've got the Great Depression and Prohibition, but Jackie was kind of immune to that. Her clients were wealthy enough that they were still able to afford to get their hair done on a weekly basis, which meant she was not hurting for money. She was doing perfectly well. She was able to buy a car. She had she had everything she could want in spite of the fact that most of the country was starting to to uh, get out of work, was needing food, and everything was bad for everyone all around, but she was doing okay. I mentioned it was also during Prohibition. Well, there were certain clubs that would find loopholes in Prohibition laws, um, including ways to have uh, cocktails served at beachfront properties, which uh, included a club called the Miami Surf Club, which is where Jackie and Floyd Odlum, her, uh, the night they met, had cocktails and uh, had dinner together at a party in 1932. And it was Floyd who actually gave her the suggestion that she learned to fly. And it was because it's this really interesting conversation. And I will say, and I've talked about this before a little bit, that, you know, I'm kind of taking Jackie's memories of these things with a grain of salt. She recalls a conversation going one way. Memoirs are self-serving. We know that going in. So the way Jackie tells it, she's at this dinner. She's very attracted to this, this man who just seems very gentle and doesn't seem like a tycoon in any way, even though he definitely is. Um, and uh, she starts kind of discussing her business a little bit, that she's part owner in some smaller salons. She has a roster of clients, all this stuff. But what she really wants to do is actually get out of the shop and travel and she recalls to him, she tells him about this time where she used to actually sell dress patterns from city to city on the road. And she loved it because she loved being able to be out in the open air and actually see the country. And she kind of confessed this private ambition to him that night of she'd like to start her own cosmetics company and and really launch herself as a business because she knew she couldn't go much further in a salon. But as the head of a cosmetics company, there was no stopping her. And it was Floyd who said, well, if you want to make money selling cosmetics during this economic depression, you're going to have to cover more ground than you could possibly cover in a car. You should get your pilot's license. And that's why Jackie learned to fly. So Jackie was so taken by this idea that Floyd kind of punted out there over dinner one night of, you know, get your pilot's license, cover more ground, start your company and, you know, being be the, be the flying cosmetic salesman. She made a bet with him and got that she would. She made a bet with him that she wouldn't be able to get her license in three weeks. She said she could do it in three weeks. He said she would need at least six weeks. She did it in less than three. Um, and she describes the first time she got in the air that it was like her world changed. Like all of a sudden, she describes it as why did I put off this reason for being for so long? And this is, she immediately quit her job at Antoine's and started flying for a living. And also it helps that, you know, her relationship with Floyd started getting more serious and he had a ton of money <laughs> and could facilitate getting her planes and helping her enter into these air races. So almost immediately when she learns to fly, Jackie turns her back on everything that she was before to pursue this new path. But in 1935, she decides that she wants to actually go back to what started it all, this idea of selling cosmetics on the road, and actually start her cosmetics company. So she does. Again, she had a ton of financial and emotional, but mostly financial support from Floyd. So her first step in launching a cosmetics company, which I mean, I've never, I've never flown, nor have I launched a cosmetics company. So I can only imagine it's just like a what, ha what happens now? Um, her first steps were to hire a, uh, a cosmetic chemist and a perfume consultant and just have them start working on something that she wanted to see in the market. So she'd been, even though she was now firmly in 1935, she's firmly like, going to be an aviatrix like her goal in life is to be a world famous pilot 
she still knows what it means to be feminine. She still had this idea and she had so much firsthand knowledge that for a lot of women, getting your hair done or having some beauty treatment is not just a superficial change. It's an emotional pick me up. And she knew that was really important. And she herself valued her femininity. She valued looking good and feeling good about herself. So she wanted to bring that to other women in a way that would be, uh, that would kind of work for women on the go, working women, women who didn't want to spend all of their time in a salon, but still wanted to feel really good about themselves. She also knew what did and did not exist on the market. So her first goal was actually to create a non-greasy hydrating face cream, which as nothing like that existed on the market. And she knew it was possible because she did a lot of working with different kinds of lubricants in airplane engines. So she knew that there were uh, there were uh, compounds out there that could keep something lubricated without making it oily, that could keep something lubricated without drying up too fast. She knew that these compounds had to exist because they existed in engine lubricants. So she took the stuff to her chemists and said, figure out what's going on in here and make it a face cream. Those are, those are her early directions. She needed something that would be super deep hydrating without keeping making your skin oily. The result, okay, so there's going to be a lot of show and tell today. So the result was uh, a moisturizer. Let's see if I can get this to show up. A moisturizer called Flowing Velvet. Not, not the best, uh, not the best lighting for this, but a moisturizer called Flowing Velvet. And it was, um, I'm just going to pause because I don't want to miss this later, but ne nefarious technology. Thank you so much for the donation. That's, I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so Flowing Velvet did kind of meet her needs, and this is super gross. <laughs> um, I don't know what year this is. I don't know what year this packaging is. Um, I want to say it's maybe 40s, maybe 50s. But like it's super gross. It's it's separated. I I don't know why it's not like uh, I don't know how to make this show up on the webcam. Darn it! I got better. Oh, there it is. It's like not. It's it's falling apart and it's pretty disgusting. Um, but this was her her first like major breakthrough in a product. Um, obviously not with the packaging right away, but it it was this moisturizer that promised to give women a natural looking, soft and dewy complexion without leaving any kind of oily residue. So this became kind of her her starting point and her trademark. And what she did next was take all of the samples of these products that were being developed in her lab into a salon in Chicago and tested them on clients. And whatever the clients liked, didn't like, helped hone the product into something that she finally felt comfortable to actually take out into onto the market to try to sell it. So while her chemists and her researchers are actually testing all of these products on clients, she leases office space on the 35th floor of 635th Avenue in Manhattan, which is very near Rockefeller Center. And I'm reasonably sure Floyd got the lease for her, and I'm reasonably sure she loved it because it was up high above the city and offered her a view down into the city. Um, once she got the office space, she officially launched the Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics Company with her aviation-based slogan of Wings to Beauty. So once she had the letterhead, the official office space, everything was set up to run a business, then she had the samples back from her lab based on the client's feedback in Chicago. She took all of these little samples out to various stores. Of course, she flew them out herself um, to try to get businesses and department stores to actually pick up and use her products. And she got into Pogues in Cincinnati and Hale Brothers in Cleveland were her first two accounts, followed by B. Foreman's in Rochester, then J.W. Robinson's in California. And the store in California actually billed her right alongside Elizabeth Arden as the only two luxury lines in what is already a very upscale department store. And I uh, don't know how many uh, cosmetics people we have in the chat right now, but Elizabeth Arden is still a very big name and is one of like the biggest of the in the cosmetics industry. There's, I mean, at this point, people have bought other things and it's all kind of a mess. But Elizabeth Arden is one of like the founders of the American makeup industry. And Jackie was right alongside it, which is super interesting. So once she had her her big sort of the the first pro few products going and kind of knew where things were going. 
Then Jackie's attention shifted to turn to packaging and how exactly to um, to market these things. So we're going to go a little bit into, I'm sorry, I'm getting my show and tell already here. We're going to go into a little bit of marketing, um, kind of the actual products first before I talk about how she marketed them because they're all really interesting. So um, I, I don't have anything more to say about this, but Flowing Velvet eventually, let me get my webcam back up. Flowing Velvet eventually became, can you see it? I don't, is this why beauty bloggers say this? I don't know how this works. Um, Flowing Velvet became a face mask as well. So basically like Flowing Velvet became her, um, her like signature thing. Like everything was like Flowing Velvet lips, Flowing Velvet face mask, Flowing Velvet body wash. Like everything was Flowing Velvet. That was her thing. Um, so when it came to packaging, Jackie originally launched her line with the idea of it being something, like I said, for women on the go, women who needed to throw their stuff in a bag and have everything with them, whether it be a purse or a flight bag. That was kind of how she she balanced like the the average woman with her as the rare flying woman. And she developed a few things that would allow women to have a certain amount of beauty on the go while still being really uh, fashionable. So this is one of her, we're still working on figuring out how to share screen so I can show pictures. Um, but this is one of one of Jackie's uh, kind of most interesting things. This is the perk up stick. None of this is going to show up on this webcam. I got better internet, but my webcam is still pretty terrible. So this is the perk up stick. You cannot see the writing on it. Darn it. Um, it says it says perk up Jacqueline Cochran, New York, New York on it. Um, it is a little it's about three and a half inches. I wish you could feel the plastic on this because it's so much nicer. Um, breaking Lucky 17. Uh, thank you for your donation. I really appreciate it. The show and tell items towards the spaceman. The spaceman's behind me. Um, hand behind for focus. I'm tr I know I'm not good at this. Guys, this is why I don't do makeup tutorials because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, also, I do the exact same makeup every single day and I'm not even good at that. So here's the, there we go. Okay. You can kind of see it actually still has the writing on it. Um, I think this one would have been, come on, webcam refocus. I think this would have been sometime 1940s based on the color. Um, and what it is, it's just a little stick. You see uh, any ladies out there would maybe know the like stackable makeup cases that they have now. This thing comes apart into little sections. So you can actually take your makeup with you. It was designed, it was designed to hold basically whatever you needed it to hold. Um, but it could hold a cleansing cream, a foundation, eyeshadow, clear rouge, solid perfume, and a sifter for face powder at the bottom. And this was kind of her staple product in terms of packaging. So it would be your flowing velvet face, face wash or your face powder. Um, the light is too bright for shiny items. That is true. Um, there's actually some powder still in here, which I will not ever put near my face. Um, and there is, I think this is... I think this is actually a lip color, if you can see a little bit. Nope, it's way too washed out with that light. It's a terrible ring light, guys. I know. Um, but it's this, like, really... It's a really gross peachy pale pink, <laughs> um, which I never want to touch either because it's super old and, and gross. But... Um, this thing is super cool, and I love that these are so hard to find. I actually have three of them, one of which is missing a section. Um, Daniel just asked, how expensive were these to purchase? It varies. It varies a lot. Um, eBay is my new best friend slash worst enemy. Um, some of the, and a lot of these, I will say, were gifts. And uh, again, price is all over the map, and I'm super lucky people, um, some, someone has gifted me a lot of things, um, including this perk up stick. Um, one of this, and this is actually something that it, I'm pretty sure she developed this in the late thirties, um, based on the fabric. This is, oh gosh, just dropped a mirror. So that's the perk up stick that could take your makeup with you. This is the perk up kit. I've never, I had never even heard of this when I got this as a Christmas present. Um, so we're going to try to show this off. These are all these pictures, by the way, are much better in the blog post that unfortunately I couldn't link because my original stream died. So this is the original perk up kit, the deluxe perk up kit, which is actually super cool. Um, 
It is a bottle of lotion, which is not labeled flowing velvet, just skin lotion, but probably would have been flowing velvet. Here is a little spatula to actually clear out all of your, um, to clear out the compartments in the perk up stick. And the perk up stick in this case is black with cream. And I've actually seen, you can actually see there's a different, I don't know if you can actually see it. It's very faint. It's, it's really like, you can kind of see it's a different font on the Jacqueline Cochran. It's, it's almost, it's almost completely rubbed off. So it's really hard to see, but, um, the perk up stick for all of your, your beauty on the go needs. Oh, there goes the mirror again. This thing does not stay in here very well. Um, and a lipstick, which actually has some of the original color in it. I'm going to show you guys, even though I feel like this is not the audience that's going to be interested in what a 70 year old tube of make of lipstick looks like. It is this color. It is a very, very classic red, a little bit too orange for my skin tone, but it's actually a really pretty color. I have not tried it. I will not put some drill makeup on my skin. Um, and I believe that this case is Fabricoid. It is a kind of fake leather that she developed. Um, and one thing I, I think the, the Fabricoid is interesting because she she used this in all of her kits. She would have she had a um a weekend makeup kit that she sold with kind of like everything a woman needs for a quick trip away. It was also the same fabric she used for the flight bags that she had the U.S. Army Air Force issue all of the wasps in the Second World War. So Fabricoid became kind of her staple for a lot of bags. Um, I have a, tr a Jacqueline Cocker and train case and hat box. They are uh, real leather, um, but Fabricoid seems to be her go-to for a cost-effective uh, option, which the Army Air Force would have been in 1943 when all of the girls were issued Fabricoid flight bags. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, I love this perk up kit. It's so interesting. So um, that's not, so we've got her, her, uh, her kits that are the same material as the flight bags, but there's a, a more, even a more interesting, uh, talk about this one, there's even a more interesting overlap with aviation. Um, in the late 1930s, I want to show you guys this insert that I found. Um, in the late 1930s, she actually hired an industrial designer to develop other packaging. So she had the perk up stick, she had various things, but she wanted her bottles of products to actually have a certain feel. And she hired uh, Raymond Lowy, which, um, how many of you guys have heard of him? Because I put this bottle of hand lotion up on the internet and everyone was like, I know who that is. I'm like, why? <laughs> Raymond Lowy, Lowy sorry, um, is known as the father of streamlining. He was an industrial designer who worked on everything from, he actually designed the Lucky Strike cigarette pack in 1935. He also, um, he also developed uh, a lot of train designs and truck designs that would streamline them. He also worked with NASA streamlining the inside of the S4B and Skylab in the late 1960s. So we're going to talk about Raymond Lowy on another date when I've had a chance to actually go through all of his stuff. I've heard the name with reference to cars. I had no idea he'd worked with NASA. Uh, Trashman4444. I'm down with all kinds. History of all kinds. Thank you so much for the vote of confidence and also for the donation. I, I do appreciate it. And if anybody's donated and I missed it, I'm so sorry. I'm I'm going between two, two things here on my screen. So if I don't see you, I'm not ignoring you. I just didn't see it. Um, so she hired uh, Raymond Lowy to develop packaging. And what she, he, he didn't just work on the, the design of the bottles. He worked on new uh, new materials for everything because he wanted her line to feel expensive, to feel really, really rich, but still be very affordable. He also wanted it to be practically very easy to ship from, you know, from factory to, to store, but also for women to carry in a bag. So there were a lot of things, um, from kind of the design side, from Jackie's side of things, she really wanted everything to be lightweight and easy to pack because she wanted to take it all in her plane and wanted the same thing for women. She wanted it to be something that would be easy for women on the go. That's kind of her entire thing, women on the go. So not only did he develop, uh, I found, so here's, so here's where, okay. I have no idea when this bottle, 
Let me see if I, maybe if I turn, I'm going to turn down the light ever so slightly while I show you guys this. There. Maybe I'll just leave it low for a bit. Um, so the Jacqueline Cochran hand lotion. It's got this very like subtle little intricate design here that just gives me that feeling of like, oh, this is mid-century streamlined everything. Let's look at the lid. I'm trying to see what you guys can see. Okay, there we go. Uh, the lid has this S shape on it. Um, the S shape is actually designed to recall the curve of a single propeller engine airplane. So actually, Jackie has this picture of her with uh, the propeller from the, I don't think I have that picture on hand, but um, Jackie has a picture of herself with the propeller from her 1938 Bendix winning plane. And I'm pretty sure that was actually the inspiration for this, this, uh, this curve on the light on the uh sorry not the light <laughs> the light worked i see but on the cover or the the lid of this jar so i found this um i know we're going to talk about research and stuff later but um i did find this insert or this article plastics in the cosmetics field from modern packaging 1939 or 38 rather and uh this is where she talks or this article talks a lot about raymond lowey designing for her and how this became kind of the iconic thing for jacqueline cochran cosmetics um we're going to turn this right back down quickly um it's actually on the top of the there it is you can see it's on the top of the perk up stick as well so this kind of became the the, the go-to thing that like unites all of her products um in terms of the jars and the bottles but it actually went beyond that he developed a lot of new materials for her packaging um he he looked at new kinds of molded plastics and integrated metal and glass containers um, for her line specifically to give that feel of something that was really high end while still being lightweight and affordable. And the moisturizer pot he developed actually has an, a, a very strange link to uh, Colt firearms in that it was created. I can show you guys this picture maybe. You can see there's like the inner there we go the inner the inner bowl and the outer packet and then this would be the lid so he he de designed it to um to protect the product inside and it was made of a material called colt rack supreme which re uh, resisted any moisture so nothing could be absorbed into the material that would then have an effect on the actual product and that material was developed and made by Colt Firearms, which is like not the connection to Jackie's cosmetics line I would ever expect to know. So that was interesting. Um, even the color scheme that her stuff developed, which I believe this is one of the shades of gray, which is just like white against my skin in this light. But um, she even developed a color scheme that was supposed that was meant to be very evocative of the era. Um, it was a, a mix of dawn gray and ivory. I guess this would be the ivory color. I don't have anything in the dawn gray, but the ivory color that she picked because they could easily lend themselves to modern interior schemes and would complement the colors on the average woman's dressing table and her accessories and would give an air of sophistication. She even trademarked the color scheme, and it was hers to use exclusively in her cosmetics line for 20 years. So that would have been through the 40s and 50s. Um, she did not start small. <laughs> when Jackie launched her cosmetics business, she did not start small. Um, so when it came to actually branding and selling her cosmetics, her life as a flyer became a huge part of that. Not only were stores interested in carrying her line because she had this allure of like, ooh, the faming flying cosmetician, um, she would use it in ad copy. And I just want to show you guys if I can find this real quick. I found this thing in the... Um, in the Eisenhower Library. I couldn't get... It was this massive thing about this big that I had to unfold and take pictures of separately, but it's this insert from Harper's Bazaar from 1939. And it basically brings together all these different little write-ups about her cosmetics company. And I just want to show you guys this one. I think I put this in the blog post too, but this one is this little ad about her. That's the bottle. Oops. <laughs> that's the bottle of lotion that I just showed you guys. Ah, this one. That's definitely this bottle. And she's sitting there in her little aviation helmet thing and her, her cap and her goggles. So 
her life as a pilot became not only kind of iconic of the brand, but it was also used in how she, how the, the copy for her ads was written up. It was always Jacqueline Cochran, the aviatrix, uses this special eye bath. As a pilot, she knows the importance of healthy, rested eyes. And all of the copy was always, her cosmetics have been subjected to a severe test, the test of professional use in years of flying. And people loved it. It made her line so different than anything else because even it was a good product, but it had this novelty of being something that that was, you know, oh, if, if Jackie uses this when she's flying at altitude, if she uses this in a race, then it's definitely good enough for me going to my office job. You know, not a lot of women were flying at the time. There were maybe 500 licensed women in America at the time. And every woman had to have, you know, a, 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 again, this is the 30s. We're in the Depression, but there were working women. <laughs> um, you know, this is, this is if, if, it, if it stands up to Jackie in this high-flying, literal high-flying job, of, you know, high altitude aviation, then it's good enough for me. So there was a lot of really interesting ways that she kind of, it became an extension of herself in a lot of ways. And this does continue on as the line develops. Um, and she started, Jackie really did a lot in interviews. She would kind of link the two. She would discuss her beauty regimen when she was flying Flying, uh, flying in a race that she would say, you know, never wear rouge because as you get pale at high altitude, you'll end up with these blotchy red marks and nobody wants that. But definitely wear an eye cream to keep this very delicate skin from drying out and wear an oil-based tinted foundation because you can wear that and it won't be disrupted by uh, an oxygen mask. And, you know, extrapolating from that, you know, this is my sporty look, but you can do the same sporty look. It's very young and attractive with sports clothes and kind of used this as like, well, here's what I do in my exciting life. And here's exactly how you can use this in your exciting life. So it became this thing of, of you know, her, her personal philosophy became her branding. She was very into uh, women understanding their skin types, women uh, wearing makeup that complemented them, that should never be about trends, it should be about what makes the woman feel like her best, most beautiful self, because that does come with a very big confidence boost. Um, she she also, but at the same time, she believed in, you know, bold colors and everything. And um, this one, this will show up. Here's the cover of Vogue from uh, October 15th of 1941. And that is Jacqueline Cochran's Perk Up Red Lipstick on the model. So as much as she was, you know, making this for... Um, making this for the women on the go, for working women, she was not never <laughs> above being on the cover of Vogue. So as as Jackie's life kind of developed, the the cosmetics line developed too. It was always something, you know, she was always getting out of a plane and posing with her perk up stick like oh I just landed oh let me just touch myself up um always for photo ops whether it was going to be for an aviation thing that was like oh she's also a businesswoman or if it was going to be a beauty thing oh she just landed her plane the two were always very connected of course during the second world war all of that went on the back burner um when she after she flew a bomber overseas and then started working with the air transport auxiliary and then came back to America and led the women's air force service pilots she had finally, for the first time ever in 1941, actually hired somebody to run the business for her. Um, although I, I believe Floyd was doing a lot of that in the first place. So she hired a gentleman named Mr. Vaughn, who started really adding, you know, a significant management structure into the into the business. Well, Jackie led the first ever flying arm of the Air Force or the Army Air Force uh, of, of women. Post-war, um, she returned back to the business industry or the beauty industry slash her business with a lot of energy and sought to expand. She bought a new building. It was at 10 West 56th Street for anyone who's in Manhattan. Uh, this was actually a former six-story private residence, so a massive house for Manhattan, um, a six-story walk-up that she turned into a uh, a retail space on the first floor, a training space on the second floor, office spaces and admin offices upstairs, and then a large employee lounge with a safe corporate culture on the top floor. The more she grew the business, the more she was in new uh 
had had a bigger presence in department stores. She had, and I don't have any good pictures of them, but all of her displays in her her cases, she actually won a lot of awards for having revolutionary displays or very interesting displays. I'm trying to find a bit more of that, but she also had every single makeup counter of hers, which they were growing. And whenever someone said they were going to carry her line and then she popped in and didn't see it, they got a very angry letter. I found a couple of those letters. Um, is the, oh, sorry. Uh, Thank you, Dale, for a two dollar donation. How tall was Jackie Cochran? She stood about five foot seven. Some sources say five foot five. Somewhere in there. So she's mi ooh, hi. That's I don't know if you guys could hear that one, but that was nuts. Um, every makeup counter also carried the Jacqueline Cochran personal analysis chart, and this is. This is like, they still do this at a lot of places. They're not nearly this uh, extreme anymore, at least not since that I've seen, but they have, every place will have something like this where they show you um, kind of what, what the products are, what works for your skin tone. And like, I've seen ones, I've had ones done where like they do the makeup on the paper for you to show you how it's supposed to go together. Um, so this is the personal analysis chart. It would give you all of the different skin types and everything, specialties, anything that you could possibly need. I like morning and night treatment, basic, cleansing cream, lotion, quick cleanser, super cleanser, flowing velvet in all caps. It was just, she was just all about the flowing velvet. This was really her, like, her big thing. Um, and it keeps going with makeup. So first is skincare, then makeup. And it's, um, I won't go through all of it, but just every one of her possible colors, it's not a huge line. Like, According to this, and I've never seen the full, the full, full list, but um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. She's got ten lipstick colors, which, I mean, I have more than ten lipstick colors, and I only wear one of them ever. <laughs> um, she had green mascara. That's interesting. Um, it was not a huge line, but she really focused on having sort of the best quality stuff that was going to be your absolute go-to. So it was never about costume makeup or never about sort of the more extreme stuff. It was all about making something that would be just what you wear every day and you, you stick with it. Um, and of course just press. I mean, it's like a book it's, it's, you know, here's what Harper's Bazaar has to say about flowing velvet. I mean, it's, it's just, it's yeah. She put everything in there because it all had to be in there. Um, I'm sifting through my files in here to see if I've got other stuff that I want to share with you guys because I love that cover of Vogue. That Vogue cover is great. And I think it's so interesting that as her as her cosmetics line was developing, um, you know, she's on the cover of Vogue with her lipstick and then in Vogue as the foremost flying female in the country. Uh, so it's, it's I mean, it's kind of great, this duality of her. Uh, super quick, Daniel and technical support. Thank you both for uh, donations. Incredible live stream info. I, I hope you're enjoying it. Thank you guys so much. Just wanted to break and say thank you. So as Jacqueline Cochran's empire grew in the cosmetics industry, she did take on other businesses. She, uh, in the early, late 1940s or early 1950s, um, and when I say I don't know exactly when it happened, I just haven't, I didn't pull all of her cosmetic stuff from the archives because I was not writing a book about her cosmetics company, but I wanted some of those details. I took some of the basic overall stuff, but I'm, I'm re we'll talk about this in a minute, but I'm reasonably sure Floyd did most of the business stuff and I didn't go through his papers on her business. Um, so for, according to a 1952 interview, which means she must have bought in the late, late 1940s or very early 1950s, she bought Chabert, she bought Nina Ricci, she bought a luggage company and was also uh, one of her, her things. She and Floyd had a moving picture exchange for foreign distribution. Uh, Floyd owned RKO Pictures for a while, which distributed, among other things, Disney. <laughs> um so her company was also by no means a small one. She had over, I think, over 800 employees at the peak. Um, and it was a huge industry. It was all over the United States. And in the 1950s, in the early 1950s, she was second only to Estee Lauder in size, which um, if if you are if you know cosmetics at all, Estee Lauder is still one of the biggest brands. Um, I don't know too much about the arrangement of modern cosmetics companies, but I do know. So on a personal note, I wear Mac. Um, it's, 
it's uh it's Canadian. <laughs> their their pigments are absolutely beautiful. And I think 10 years ago they were bought by Estee Lauder. So Estee Lauder is one still one of the absolute biggest brands in cosmetics because it owns a lot of other smaller brands now. Um, but I still like Mac. Uh so yeah, that Jackie's company was right up there with Estee Lauder is huge. I mean, that's that's not a small little like I have a brand and a YouTube channel. This is like, I am, I'm one of the big ones in the country. And she was also in the rest of the world. When she was in England with the air transport auxiliary, she had a lot of meetings about the cosmetics company. She was trying to get distribution in other countries. I don't know how extensive it went, but she was all over the place. But in the 1950s, uh, there is a, a shift that happens in her cos in her cosmetics business up to this point, her copy had always been about, I use this eye bath when flying. I know the, the value of rested eyes. I use this while I'm flying. I know how to keep my skin healthy at altitude. I do a really tough job. I mean, flying is not good for your skin. We still know that. Um, you know, this is rough on skin. Here's what I use to repair it. It was all about kind of using her own experience to sell products. In the 1950s, it started to become all about anti-aging. And I'm, I believe that this is extremely, it, this is ex completely because she was really self-conscious about her age. Um, I have a, an ad, I, I would show you guys the ads, but they're all like rolled up in acid-free paper and I don't want to like mess with it on screen. I'm going to scan them all. A lot of them are in the, um, I love when people come in and ask why they're subscribed to the channel and then leave like, bye. <laughs> um, they're all rolled up. I don't want to, I, I, I'm going to ruin them and they're all very old, but I have this, this one ad from 1962 um, that starts, the copy starts with young, very young skin is bountifully supplied with natural oils and moisture. Now science has found a way to maintain this vital moisture balance at any age. And it's all about flowing velvet, the originator of the moisture concept, and how all the ads now feature young girls. It used to feature Jackie, and now it's featuring, like, this ad specifically is, like, a five, six-year-old girl. And it's all about anti-aging. And 1962 is the same year when Jackie once lied to a reporter saying, I would love to be the first woman in space, but they want someone under 50. And even though I'm not yet 50, I'm a little bit too old. She was almost 56. She was like days from 56 at that interview. So she's lying about her age publicly. She's starting to really kind of push back against being a woman in her late 50s. And all of a sudden, her cosmetics line starts being all about anti-aging. I have another one. You need Jacqueline Cochran's Flowing Velvet. The tagline is, your skin is showing your age. It's all about hiding your age. And uh, yeah, it was just such an interesting shift. And it was so much, it was such a, so like, as soon as I noticed that, I was like, well, obviously she was hiding everything about herself at that point. So of course, it's not about her anymore. Now it's about bringing in all of the big kind of brands. Um so uh, just another interesting note, and I, I don't totally know where this fits into her story exactly, but um, around in the 1950s, around the time when the brand started being more about anti-aging and more about Jackie hiding her age, even though, by the way, like she's she's in her late 50s and she's still breaking records all over the place. Um she, this is like she's not she's not slowing down, but she's very self-conscious about her age. Um she started getting, you know, very famous models and actresses to model for her brand. It was no longer just her. Marilyn Monroe was one of her models at one point. She also had Paul Rand, who's an, a, a legend of advertising design for media, um, making her ads and developing her ads. And this started in the late 40s. So it was really starting to shift it from the the ads with Paul Rand started shifting from Jackie the Aviatrix and her cosmetics to this is, I have one, this is the house that Jacqueline built. And it's all about how these things look in the home. And the packaging became less this sophisticated 1930s design and more this like cutesy 1950s design, which is very much, I mean, I've, I've talked about this in the book too. Um, 
you know, every government campaign that had women in the factories in the 1940s be- to help with the war effort, all of a sudden was telling them to go home and take care of the families in the 50s. So it's like the shift of gender roles was weirdly reflected in her branding when she herself did not describe to that at all. Um, Dale, I want a quick break. Thank you so much for uh, for your donation. I really appreciate it. Are males or females more suited to fly? Uh, fly airplanes or spacecraft? Um, no, <laughs> I, I don't, uh, the, I mean, the only benefit of women is on average women are smaller and lighter. So you can, you don't need as much fuel to get a woman off the ground. And I mean, with an airplane, that means you can take a bit more fuel on board or, um, but I mean, it's such a minor difference when you think about the fact that you need skill, you need skill to fly. So I think the best human for the job, whatever it is, um, Okay, let me see. So I just want to go through, before I go through the end of the company, because it did die a very bizarre death, I just want to show you guys a couple more things. Um, Although the coolest is by far the perk-up kit, which comes in this little cardboard box that someone once drew a face on. Um, I just want to show you a couple other things. So, right... Her line went from this beautiful streamlined, I know this is, I would love to almost clean this and use it. Her line went from this beautiful streamlined stuff to like, this. (laughs) this. <laughs> this is so not what you'd expect based on where she started. This is a compact and it's designed after, let's see, is that going to work? Let me turn this down a little bit more. Um, it was designed after one of Louis XIV's snuff boxes. It's not going into focus. Huh? Anyways, it does say JC on very ornate font. That's what that is. But this is just a little, like a little compact there's the screen. <laughs> um, and this is designed to hold either pressed or loose powder. So she had a bunch of these things and they became much more intricate. My personal favorite though, which is another flowing velvet one, uh, is this, this very simple gold compact with a giant mirror in it. Um, I actually have one of these that's empty that I actually carry. Um, this one is, uh, what is it? Flowing velvet curtain of light. I don't know what that means but flowing velvet curtain of light. (laughs) Um, It is a, uh, it's a pressed powder. It's this very kind of beigey pinky. It's probably too pink for me. I don't know. I don't wear that. So I don't know. Um, Other compacts. Uh, I saw a compact. Oh, the the makeup museum website. I I have seen that article from the makeup museum, actually. Uh, It's a good one. It's, and it has a lot of interesting things in it. Um, So let's talk about the end of the cosmetics bit industry for Jackie because it's it's like she built up this massive thing and it kind of disappears in a very strange way so like I said F- Floyd was a brilliant businessman okay Floyd Floyd was 100% running the show behind the scenes um he he was his major company was the Atlas Corporation it had all this so many subsidiaries and a bunch of other things. It was involved in everything. Like I said, he ran RKO Pictures for a time. That was actually, it was because of Floyd that Eisenhower was able to get Disney to back his campaign with the I Like Ike song because Floyd was working with Roy Disney and was able to secure that ad for Eisenhower because Jackie and Floyd were friends with the Eisenhowers. Yeah, they knew everybody. So Floyd is definitely the one running a lot of the business. And I found a um I found a an, a document of sale. It's not a it's not a legal document. It's a letter um wherein Floyd is writing about the sale of a company called 630 Holding Incorporated, which 630, if you guys remember, was her first address on Fifth Avenue that she had that office uh, on the 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 what's 35th floor, I think I said. Um, so 630 Holding Company was the parent company that fully owned the subsidiary that was Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics. So definitely, definitely Floyd was running the show. Um, and all of the other companies, like when they took over Nina Ricci, I'm pretty sure it probably came under 630 Holding. And um, that probably made it such that Floyd was able, I'm sure it was something complicated that I do not understand, but that Floyd was able to make it such that if she lost money, she wouldn't be responsible for it, but he could lump it under one of his business ventures and have it not actually be a risk for either of them, which I don't know how that works, but I know that someone like Floyd could figure it out. 
So in June of 1964, I found this letter um, going over all the assets of the Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics Company, and it owned a little over 3.1 million in company assets. And now that I think about it, I am going to pull up an inflation calculator um, and see what that is by today's standards, because it's a decent amount. I have no idea what a cosmetics company is worth on average, but like, um, yeah, that's that's not a small amount of assets. Let's see if I can do this really quick. What did I say? 3.1. Okay, that's like 25, that's almost $26 million, which like, I guess is a good amount of assets for a company. <laughs> um, so in, in June, Floyd had this letter saying that Jackie was relieved of her lease at that address on the 30th of the month and outlining all of the assets, all of the holdings, what, you know, and it's all broken down into what was physical assets, what was, um, you know, in marketing stuff. That was also the year that they sold the company. So I'm pretty sure that lease breaking the lease on that building is part of the sale of the company. Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics was acquired by a company called Schulten in 1965, along with all of the subsidiary brands, including Nina Ricci, which included fragrances, I actually have a perfume bottle I forgot to bring out, um, Endo Cream, and Marcel Frank Atomizers. And this marked Jackie's exit from the business world. Which I think is really interesting that it was 1964 because 1964 was the year she set something like 19 records in a single flight. You know, so she's still not stopping. This is also the flight, if you guys have read Fighting for Space, the last uh, sequence before the epilogue of Jackie, um, where she's breaking Mach 2 point something in this like bounded tunnel in the sky, this extreme precision fighting or fighting, flying. Um, that was was the year she sold the business. So it's not like she's selling this business because she's getting too old to run it. She also wasn't really managing it. I think what was happening at the time, she was nearing 60 and was starting to look at slowing down a little bit. And Floyd's health was failing pretty badly. And between the two of them, and Floyd had made a few bad business decisions in the late 1950s, early 60s, they were actually losing a lot of money. And I suspect the sale was to relieve them of some of the responsibility and some of the debt that they maybe had with the company. Um, they sold the house in Manhattan. They had an, an apartment in Manhattan as well as this massive compound in Indio, the Cochrane Odlum Ranch. They sold the Manhattan house not long after selling the cosmetics company and kept up appearances at the ranch until they finally had to sell it in 1970. So I think the company went defunct or was out of her hands largely because of their larger financial situation. So the company actually went on without Jackie for a number of years, and it it finally disappeared in the 1990s. And I haven't been able to find anything definitive about what happened to it. Um, I'm sure there's more in Floyd's financial papers. Um, but I, like I said, I just haven't pulled everything from Floyd's stuff. But I do want to know. And I'm really curious about it because I have also heard that Jackie actually destroyed some financial records um, after Floyd's death to hide how bad their debt got. Um, when you think about it, they had this like thousand acre property in Indio. I've been out there. It's a golf course and uh, like community living place now, but it's huge. It's a massive property that they ended up, they went from that to Jackie living alone in a one room apartment at the end of her life. Like they lost a lot. So I'm, I want to see how much this was a part of it or how much it wasn't a part of it. So that's the story. I think that's all I have to show too. I don't know. I'll show you guys a soap dish, but, um, that's the story of Jacqueline Cochran cosmetics, which I think is such an interesting facet of Jackie. And I, I love that it's part of her story and part of her life because so often, and this is where like, you know, on a personal level, I get really annoyed. I just, okay, this is Maxime de Paris. This is a soap distributed by Jacqueline Cochran. It still smells really good. It's actually still in its original plastic. Let's see if I can get it to, oh, it won't. There we go. It's kind of pick up. You can kind of see that there's a film on it. Um, it actually doesn't smell terrible of everything. All of this stuff smells like your grandmother did in the eighties. Except this. This smells really good, but I'm not going to use it. Um, I, I, I love the duality of Jackie as being this incredible pilot and this woman who ran a cosmetics company and felt very strongly about women feeling good about themselves for both what they do and how they present themselves. And 
I love it because women today, and this is like the personal rant, and I'm not going to go on a big one, but women today are so often told if you're going to be professional, you have to look a certain way, or if you want to be taken seriously to look a certain way, as opposed to like, oh, your merits are what will make you stand out. It's like, no one will take you seriously with dyed hair. It's just like, wh why are we doing this? Because no one would look twice at a man with tattoos. So it's, you know, I love that in the 30s, Jackie refused to make the separation of the two sides of her, that it was as important for her to be feminine and feel good in her femininity as it was for her to be taken seriously as a pilot because she knew she could do both things very well and why would she choose? And I just, I love that. I think that's a great model for, I mean, Jackie's flawed. We know she is not no one's perfect she's very flawed but I, this element of her i really like um that's me talking for an hour so let's uh let's go through some questions i do have a few thank you uh thank you lovely helper behind the scenes for <laughs> organizing some of these i see a few in this doc here um I'm going to sift through this. I do have to go in 15 minutes guys so we're going to have to keep this one a little bit short cuz i have a meeting um let me see what we got going here um, okay. Uh, first up, uh, Ruben Ruiz, if you're still here, um, you just threw out earlier that you bought the book recently. Thank you so much. And, um, I really hope you enjoy it. Okay. We're looking, just give me a second. Water. Okay, Michael Morgan asked why the Eisenhower Museum has Jackie's slash Bessie's life. Um, and Daniel Belkwell asked, along the same lines, Jackie seemed closer to LBJ. Why were the papers not in his library? So I think, I don't know too much about like how close the couples were, but I, I know she was close with both couples. Um Eisenhower actually wrote his memoirs at her house, one of his memoirs at her house. So it might have been like there was some arrangement. It might have just been that like he offered first. I mean, I, I think it's a uh, I don't really know why exactly it was there. I'm sure there's something in the the donation note, which I have read. I just it's been a while. Um, but yeah, I all you know. I, Honestly, guys, all I really care about is that they're there. <laughs> they're somewhere at all. Granted, the LBJ library would be a lot easier to get to. Um, Abilene, Kansas is tough. You have to drive two hours from Wichita, which is already hard to get to. But that's why they're there. Um, Floyd seemed much older than Jackie. I actually think I saw Daniel looked this up. Um, Floyd's born, I think, and I saw someone put it in the chat. It might have been you. It was, uh, I think it was 1898 he was born. Um, 1892. So, yeah, he was older than Jackie, but she was born in 1906, so not that much older. Um, yeah. Uh, and I did see a question of why would it have been, would six... 630 Holding be Floyd's company? Um, yes, I 100%. I'm... I Okay. I don't think Jackie would have had the business sense to start a parent company that would have owned Jacqueline Cochran Cosmetics as a subsidiary for, because like, why would you do that? I'm not a business person. I don't know why you would do that. Floyd is a business person. He's writing a letter about this. I'm reasonably sure he knew a rationale to make that happen, to make that decision. Um I, it's it's got to be something about assuming some kind of risk or having it be under his parent company, whether it was Atlas, or whether it was something else. Um, but yeah, there was some some for for whatever reason, I'm like reasonably sure that Floyd arranged her business stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't get business stuff, it's really hard to figure out why you should have things arranged the way you do. But that one just seems like a Floyd move. Um, Oops, uh, Sean asked where in Indio it's called Indian Palms Ranch now. I think it's called Indian Palms. Uh, yes, Indian Palms Country Club. If you Google that, you will find it. Um, that is that is the answer to that. It's not a long one, but it's one. <laughs> okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, Ike died a few years before LBJ too. Yes. Um, I don't know when the gift was after 
you know, it might have something to do, and I'd have to look into this. It might have something to do with when the libraries were opened and when Jackie and Floyd died. Because I, because Floyd's papers are there too, right? So um, they might have been donated before Jackie di- died. Like she might have arranged his stuff and bequeathed all of that before her own death and arranged her own stuff and given it before she died. Um, which would maybe make sense that if it was not long after Eisenhower died and LBJ was thinking of dates if he didn't have a library yet it might have been the case that like there was something there was a physical spot for the in the Eisenhower library to put them uh whereas LBJ didn't have a space yet I don't know when the LBJ library opened now that I think about it um oh okay I saw a couple questions coming in um I don't have a pilot's license I would love to learn to fly it's on the list just like when I have time and money to do it. Because I hear it's very expensive. Um, and Quantifier asked, can you still buy Flowing Velvet? Have you tried it? You cannot. All of this stuff is from eBay. eBay, the best and the worst. Um, yeah, and I wouldn't try any of this because I don't know what happens to 70-year-old cosmetics, but I know that I don't want to put it on my skin. <laughs> Definitely not. Um I just saw a question from Trashman. Could Jackie's association with LBJ do, be due to him heading up the space program? Uh, way before that. They were friends from 1937. So it's all in the book. Um, I don't want to go through it in detail. Maybe we'll talk about it in another day. But they were friends from 1937 on. And... Uh, you know, they dealt. She dealt with him for sure uh, when when he was head of the space. Uh, was this the... Oh, I can't remember the formal title. The space, not the space program, but yeah, when he was doing the space thing. <laughs> Words are hard. Um, but yeah, they they interacted, but that was not where they met at all. Um, is there any... Okay, so other questions. Uh, I'm going to get through some of these quickly. Is there any documentary about, her, about Jackie's story? Uh, no, not a good one that I've ever heard of, so... Sorry. Um, plenty in here, though. Uh, question about the lotion, whether it contains mercury or lead. There are no, uh, there's nothing on here about ingredients, but I should look. Um, other questions about how I was able to get these, how expensive they were, um, and manufacturer year and stuff. So, all, like I said, all these are from eBay. Um, prices varied. I mean, some of these, depending on if they're People are bidding, too. Like, I won't tell you how much I paid for... This is so gross. I want to try to show you guys how gross this is. Um, I just, like... Like, ew. Like, it's just... I think the oil is separating. It, like, used to be emulsified, and now it's not. <laughs> so gross. Um, but, yeah, they, some of these have, like, little inserts. I was trying to slide back up. But they don't say much about the year. Um, but even if it's got... If there is a year, it doesn't necessarily mean the year that the product is manufactured so much as the packaging. So, like, this picture of Jackie, um, you can kind of see in this little insert. Like, I know this is an early 50s picture because I've seen the proofs of this in the library. Um, she was very airbrushed for these. <laughs> she does not look like this. Um, this, like... That that tells me when this packaging came out or when this insert was done, but I don't know if the formula is unchanged from the 30s. So, um, so yeah, it's a little bit hard. There's a lot of guesswork and a lot of kind of looking at ads to see, um, to see kind of how how the packaging changes. Like I can figure from the 1938 thing that this is probably an older one, um, probably 40s versus the. Yeah, the newer ones with old Jackie pictures in them. Um, oh, that one doesn't have it. Um, we're going through. Sorry, looking at questions. Um, did she ever trademark the bottle cap design? Not that I know of, but again, it might be in Floyd's papers, so there might be an answer out there that I just don't know. Um, she Okay, uh, she developed Fabricoid, question mark? From what I, I don't know how much she developed it so much as was one of the first people to use it, but I don't know how many people she employed that developed things that became revolutionary. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know too, too much. Like I know that she developed a lot of different materials for bottles. Um, I think this is like a fake ivory even, um, 
but that she was using stuff before uh, before it became kind of widely available on the market. She talks about um, developing a Fabricoid case. So I'm kind of going with her on that one. Oh, sorry. Talking so much. Um, okay. Okay. We got five minutes. I am going to blast through the remaining questions that are in here uh will we have an effective vaccine by 2021 i don't know um i hope so probably but i don't know uh will i write a book about the avro arrow probably not but i will probably write some stuff about it just not a book do i have faster speeds of what um I gotta say the internet upgrades making the stream better. Yay! Okay, good. Cause I I did the like the speed test before and after, and it was just like, whoa. Even the guys installing it were like, wow, your internet sucks. I'm like, I know, fix it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it for a few days and you know, cancel the other one finally. So that's good. Um Gus Grissom, uh Gus Grissom, he wrote a book that you should read if you haven't read it. Uh, Yield Gamer, uh, I think is the right name. Um, called, I think it's just called Gemini. It's really good and it's amazing that he wrote it. It was published after he died actually. Um, so super interesting. Uh, true, Estee Lauder had no flying records. Coco Chanel, was she an influence at all? I do not know, but I feel like Chanel was an influence on everything, so probably. Um, Floyd and you share a birthday. Awesome, Daniel. Um, okay. We got one last question coming in. Um, what firsts are happening today in the 20, 2020s that be suitable for vintage space in the future, like in the 2070s? Good question. Um, I don't know. I don't know because I'm living in the 1930s right now. Um, I think there's probably a lot of stuff. I would honestly, I, I, uh, I think there's probably a lot of things happening with space programs that are not being publicly discussed. Um, at least not that I'm super aware of, um, that will be excellent for vintage space content in like 50 or 60 years. Um, figuring out some of these first, like we want to actually go back to the moon. How are we doing that? Cause like really, how are we doing that? Cause we lost all the plans. Um, there's interesting stuff there. I think historians are going to have an absolute field day with, um, you know, how does the pandemic get this badly out of hand based on political reactions um that's going to be a really interesting one there's a lot of stuff coming with a. Uh, oh i totally lost my train of thought there's a lot of stuff in the aviation industry that i think is really interesting there's a i think there's more of a an interact an intersection between technology and politics now it's always been there like war is based on politics and it drives innovation and we see a lot of that but i think we're seeing it more now because we have this like in, in this like industrial political academic complex that's just like has been set up and has such big roots now that everything going forward actually has this really weird discussion of like you you can't separate these things anymore so there's going to be some really interesting like looking around at that stuff i think um that's off the top of my head again i'm like so living in this world that i'm not on board with this world um let's see if there's anything else, uh, thank you for liking my Nina Ricci scarf. I like this. Um, I think, I think that's it. I think we're good. Okay. I'm just looking at my list of questions. Um, unfortunately, guys, I have to go because I have a meeting that I have to get to in six minutes. Um, so let me do, let me rattle off all of the things that I do. Uh, and when you, where you can find it. So, Fighting for Space is my new book. That's what I've been talking about for the last hour and 17 minutes. Um, it is available on Amazon. It is available uh, through your local booksellers that are still doing uh, either pickups or sending out books. Um, I'm going to add the descriptions. I'm sorry that my stream did not work. Um, just links were there. They're not there anymore. But if you, uh, I do have a link tree now. It's, uh, was it HTTPS? colon dash dash <laughs> uh l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash amy share title you can find all the links to my social as well as book order information and my brand new newsletter um so that's the book that's available if you want to know more about the virtual book tour 
definitely follow me on Twitter. I'm posting a bunch of stuff about that, about other things. I'm going to just be sharing fun stuff from research because why not? We need something to talk about that's not viruses. Um, I'm Amy Shear Title on Twitter as well as on Instagram. And you can also follow me on Facebook. Um, Oh, trying to think of all the other things. <laughs> this will be archived for anybody who's missed it. And uh, now that I have better internet, I've had some technical problems. I'm going to be doing short, uh, like, revisions of these longer episodes in classic Vintage Space episodes, the Vintage Space episodes. So, you know, 10, 8 to 15 minute episodes breaking down in sort of shorter frame what we talked about for an hour. So those will come out as soon as I get my technical stuff mixed, uh, fixed. Um, I do have a newsletter. I have not sent one out yet, but <laughs> if you do want to subscribe to my newsletter, it's all in the link tree, uh, link tree, link tr.ee dash slash Amy Shearer title. I'll put it up in the description as soon as this is done. Um, but that will be the best way to kind of get a hold of any big news that I have. I'll announce it through all of my social platforms as well as uh, the newsletter. I'm also on Cameo, uh, which is new for me if you guys have a space loving friend or vintage aviation loving friend who just wants like a little pick me up video. Um, you can actually book me and I'll send them a little hello and tell them a story. Um, trying that out. That's new for me. So again, it's just cameo.com slash Amy Shear title. Um, is there anything else that I need to mention? Oh, I should really write a list. Um, the Virgil Victoria is continuing next week, I believe with, let me see what my next title is. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, uh, next week we are talking about astronaut qualifications in the time of Apollo and as it related to the women slash the women who took on NASA fighting for their shot in space in the 1960s. Um, on May 7th, we are talking about research and a trip to the National Archives. I'll be sharing some of that stuff with you guys because there's cool archive details and stuff that I found. Um, on May 14th, we are talking details that did not make it into the book. On May 21st, we are talking about Mercury astronauts on the women. So what the men thought about these women. And on May 28th, we're talking women scientists. Um, and after that, we'll see if we want to keep going with this or if we go back to regular videos, we'll find out. Um, so I think if there's nothing else that I need to mention, um, I think that's it. I think that's it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you learned something. I know this is a uh, different from for a lot of you guys, but we've got some fun, fun intersections between things that don't necessarily go together um thank you guys so much for sticking around i'm sorry i'm gonna try to sort out the technical stuff i'm getting a different mic next week so i have to have this in my face um we'll get it all sorted but thank you guys so much for hanging out if you've been here from the beginning thank you so much for listening to me talk for an hour and 21 minutes um if you have further questions leave them in the description of this video and i can try to answer you can always shoot me something on twitter oh the last thing i should mention um if I have any patrons in here, I do have a patron as well. If any of you guys are in here, thank you so much for your ongoing support. It really does mean so much and it's so helpful. Um, if you would like to join my patron, a dollar a month is, you have no idea how unbelievably helpful it is. Um, but thank you guys so much for your continued support. It really does mean so much to me. And thank you, those of you, again, who donate today. It means a lot. Um, so I will see you guys next week. And um, take care. Stay safe out there. Bye, guys.